Morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to the last great day. It was on that eighth day that Christ went up to the feast. He says, if there's anyone thirsty out of my belly, shall flow rivers of living water. Each one of us, particularly those that have been begotten by God's Holy Spirit, has a story to tell. We all have something in common of how God called us, how we came to the knowledge of the truth, and we have the truth in common. I don't know how God particularly got in touch with you, but once he began working with my mind, I began to understand things that I'd never understood before. And once that started happening, there were some things I had to do. I had to prove, first of all, that this book was real, and that it came from God, and that it meant what it said. So I had to test it. I had to prove it. So I started beginning, and I looked through some scriptures. I found in 2 Timothy 3.16... It said that all scripture was given by the inspiration of God. So I knew that if there was something in this book that I read, that God had inspired it. Yes, I know, man sometimes made some mistakes in their interpretation, but God doesn't make any mistakes. So the majority of this book, based upon uh, what the scriptures say, God inspired it. So if God inspired it, I knew it had to be true. Now, also, over in Hebrews 10, I'm going to do a, a few basic scriptures here just to lead up to what I'm going to say. Hebrews 10, verse 39. Paul said, but we are not of them who draw back. There were those who were drawing back. There were those who were stop, stopping the race. They had gotten tired. They were wanting to quit. They were deviating, going off in different directions, as I have seen in the past with some in God's church. But he says, we are not like that, who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe for the saving of the soul. So he said, you have to believe. So I knew that I had to believe those scriptures. I had to believe what God was saying. Now, one of the men that was there with Christ did not believe that he had been resurrected. And Thomas said, I won't believe that he was resurrected until I put my hand in his side. And when Christ opened that garment and he put his hand in that huge gaping uh, wound, he believed. But Christ told him, he says, Thomas, you've seen, you believe." But blessed are those who believe who haven't seen. I didn't see that gaping wound in his side. I didn't see this prince where the nails had been driven into his arms. I didn't see the stripes on his back. I didn't see any of that. But I read about it, and I believe it. I believe it happened, and I believe that that's why I keep the Passover every single year as a memorial of that. Now, we read in Galatians 3.22. I'll turn over there very quickly. Galatians 3.22. This is a fabulous passage of Scripture, but I don't have time to go through all of that today. But I do want to read this Scripture. It says, but the Scripture has concluded all under sin. And we realize that. All of us were under sin at one time or another until God called us. So we were under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus might be given to them that believe. So there are scriptures that say you must believe. And there are those who teach that that's all you have to do is believe. But we know better, don't we? We know that there's a whole lot more to this believing thing. There's believing and doing. Paul said that we must 
in order to in inherit eternal life, we must believe that he exists. And we've tried to bring that message to you during the feast. I know, I, I know particularly I did. I wanted you to see that this God exists, that this God is real. And there's only one, one God family. But you have to believe that he exists to inherit eternal life. And you believe that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So, having said that, we think of the millions and millions and millions of people from Adam and Eve all the way up till the seven trump sounds. I can't tell you how many people that's been. But I do know that there's people in other countries that have, have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. They worship Buddha, they worship Allah, they worship um, different gods, and even those who think they're worshiping God really aren't. And that's why I wanted to emphasize so strongly the other day that people have their gods, but it isn't the true God that they're worshiping. And the scriptures tell us that Satan the devil has deceived the whole world. Now that's hard to believe, isn't it? It's hard to comprehend that all those billions of people, at least seven billion now, have been deceived. And yet they have. And many of them can't even speak English. They can't even say the word Jesus Christ because they've never heard of it. And we read in John, the 10th chapter, a profound scripture. And it says in verse 1, Verily, verily, and this is Christ talking, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that enters not by the door under the shepherd, sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the, sh the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear the voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. You know, a shepherd who works with his sheep constantly gets to know the sheep. He knows which ones are rowdy. He knows the peaceful sheep. He knows the one that would, the sheep would follow. And those sheep hear his voice. And if he calls for them to do something, well, they will follow him. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. They understand his voice. A false shepherd sneaks in and calls for the sheep, and they don't recognize it. They only stand around, bah, bah, they don't do anything, wandering around. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know the voice. They do not know the voice of strangers. Now Christ spoke this parable unto them, but they didn't understand it. They didn't comprehend what he was saying at that time. But he said to them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he answers his question, the Bible interprets itself. It says, You can't get in except through the door. Who's the door? Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the door. I'm the only way in to the sheepfold. All that ever came before me, they're thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. There's a lot of thieves and robbers out there today, and they're asking for money to make merchandise of the people. But he says, I'm that door. By me, if any man enter in, shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that's a hireling and not the shepherd who's owned the sheep or not, seeth the wolf coming and leaves the sheep, and they flee. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. Unfortunately, a lot of God's sheep have been scattered by some of these wolves in sheep clothing. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so know I the Father because they are at one. You see, and the entire sheepfold will and must be at one. 
with the Father and with the Son and his family. And I laid down my life for the sheep. Now notice what he says here. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. There's some more sheep running around out there that are not a part of this sheepfold. But they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. At one time or another, all going to be at one, but not now. There are sheep running around out there that can't hear his voice. They're hearing another voice. They're hearing a different tune that's being played. And they think that it's the right tune. But Paul said in Acts 4 and verse 12, there's no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. That's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Came to this earth over 2,000 years ago. Gave his life for us. Shed his blood. And then on the day of Pentecost, he began a church. That church is the sheepfold. They hear his voice. They hear what he says. And here is his voice speaking to you every time you read it. Because this is the scripture that he inspires for us. All scripture is given by this shepherd for our instruction, for our admonition, for our growth and development. Now, as I said, you have your own story to tell. I have mine. I had to prove all these things. I did. And once I proved it, it increased my belief. Stronger. And it grows stronger every day. Because I continue to read it. I continue to learn more about it. I continue to learn more about God's plan. About what he intends for me. What he intends for God's sheep. To find that pasture he spoke of. Or that city that we heard about. Or that great tree, you know, that blossoms out and encompasses the whole world. Many analogies, but it all boils down to the kingdom of God, the family of God. Now, what about these other sheep that's floating around out there, wandering around astray? You know, sheep are so dumb. Sometimes you'll go out and you'll be looking for a sheep and you'll be standing on the edge of a cliff. Got down there some way, but he can't get back. Somebody has to go get them. Has to, to go find those sheep. Christ even gave an analogy. He says, leave the 99 and go find the one. So if there's one out there, we have to find it. We find it, as we mentioned today, by the preaching of the word. God has chosen his ministry to preach the word, to warn the world, if you will, of the um, coming crisis upon us. They may listen, they may not. But what about these other sheep? Well, let's understand something here today. Let's go back to Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16 and learn something about these sheep. In Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel gives us an analogy here. You know that God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he, he chose Israel as his people. He chose that small, tiny nation which started off with Abraham, and it says when they went down to Egypt, it was about 70. They came out at several million strong. But he chose them as his people. And in this world of confusion, predominantly dominated by the Babylonian mystery religion and other false religions, he chose this nation of Israel, and he decided to give them his laws. And he says, I want you to be a shining example to the world around you. I want you to obey my laws. I want you to keep my commandments. And I, I will bless you. I'll give you rain in due season. I will protect you from your enemies. I will protect you from those Amalekites and Hittites and Gergesites. All those sites he would protect them from. But he says, if you'll obey me. Well, let's see what happened. In Ezekiel 16, 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem, which is a type of Israel, to know her abominations. Well, what does that tell us? This nation that God chose as a shining example had abominations. 
And say, Thus says the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity is of the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother's a Hittite. And as for your nativity when you were born, in the day that you were born your navel was not cut. Neither was you washed in water to soup with you. You were not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. Boy, this little baby was just laying there in the afterbirth, still covered with blood and the fluids and just laying there. Nobody even came cut the cord, tied it off. They were a mess. No, I pitied you to do any of these unto you, to have compassion on you. But you were cast out in the open field to the loathing of your person in the day that you were born. They looked down on that nation, and do they not today? The whole world hates Israel, or who they think is Israel. And he said, when I passed by and saw you polluted in your own blood, I said to you, when you were in your blood, live. You're not going to die. I'm going to clean you up. Yes, I said unto you, when you were in your blood, live. Reiterate that point again. I have caused you to multiply. And did he ever. From 70 they went into Egypt. Came out several million strong. And if you understand the truth about Israel, look at us today. There's over 300 million people in the United States. Not all Israelites, but when you look at those that are true Israelites, you go to Australia, you go to South Africa, you go to Britain, you go to Canada. There's a lot of us. Those descendants of the Israelites. I caused you to multiply as the bud of the field, and you have increased, and you grew great. Did we ever? You know, they say the United States of America in its heyday is the greatest nation that ever existed. Power beyond comprehension. The world feared us, and they still do to a degree. We have that power, just afraid to use it. But you grew great, and you are come to an excellent ornaments. Your breasts are fashioned, and your hair is grown, whereas you were naked and bare. Yes, it matured. You know, we are supposed to mature. We're, we're born, and we grow up, and we fill out as mature adults. That's the way Israel did. Now, when I passed by you and looked upon you, behold, your time was a time of love. And I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. There's a symbol in, in the Bible This represents marriage when they spread your skirt over them. Yea, I swear unto you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord God, and you became mine. Exodus 19. He says, will you obey me? They said, all you say, we will do. So he gave him the terms of the covenant, Exodus 20. They agreed to it. Then washed I you with water. Yes, I thoroughly washed away your blood from you, and I anointed you with oil. I think you understand the symbolism there for uh, about baptism being washed and the oil symbolic of God's Holy Spirit. Uh, that's for his spiritual church. I clothed you also with broidered work and shod you with badger skin and I girded you about with fine linen and I covered you with silk. Boy, he, he cleaned them up. He's talking about fine garments here, expensive stuff. And he says, I put a jewel on your forehead and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown upon your head. You were decked with gold and silver. Your raiment was fine linen, silk, embroidered work. You did eat fine flour and honey and oil, and you were exceeding beautiful, and you did prosper into a mighty kingdom. Mighty comes from me. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for your beauty. For it was perfect to my comeliness, which I had put upon you, says the Lord God. But alas... You did trust in your own beauty, and you played the harlot because of your renown, but because you grew up and you were filled with pride, and you poured out your fornications on every one that passed by, his it was. So we see the abominations where they even sacrificed their own children to Molech. They worshiped the sun. They had embraced the Babylonian mystery religions and the gods of all the pagans before them. Whatever God said do, they did just the opposite. So we see in 1 Samuel 8, 1 Samuel 8, verse 4, all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together 
and came to Samuel unto Ramah. Now here's the elders. They've got a group of leaders, and they've decided for themselves that this would be better for us. We as a group have voted, and in this democracy that we have, we feel that the majority of the people should be listened to. And they said unto him, Behold, you're old, and your sons, they don't walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. We want to be like the other nations around us. But the thing displeased Samuel when, he, when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord, giving us free moral agency, did not intervene to stop the people. He let you make up your own mind. And you decide for yourself. Remember, our first parents set the stage when they rejected God. And they decided for themselves what was right and what was wrong. And at that moment, something happened. Their eyes were opened. But in essence, they were closed. Closed to God's truth. They couldn't see spiritual things anymore. So they wanted a king. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to them. Hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say unto you. For they have not rejected you they have rejected me. And so that's what Israel did. They reject, rejected God. And do you know they have done the same thing to this very day? They have not accepted Christ as their Messiah. They're still looking for him to come. So we go over to Romans, the 11th chapter. Romans, the 11th chapter. Verse 1. I say then, Paul, has God cast away his people? Did God forget them? Did he let them go back in the field and wallow around in their own waste? God forbid. He hasn't forgotten Israel. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, said he hasn't forgotten me. God has not cast away his people, which he did foreknow. He chose as his people. What you not, what the scripture has of Elias, how he makes intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your people or your prophets and dig down your altars, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. And what did he say when he thought he was all alone back there? But what said the answer of God unto him? I reserve to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. He said, oh, no, you're not alone. I have a small group, a contingency of 7,000. They don't worship those false gods. He didn't know it, though. Even so, then at this, notice what he's telling them. Right now, at this present time, right there at that time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. He said, no. He said, even though he, the majority of the Israelites have rejected God, there's a small group that haven't. And they were the elect. They were those that God had called and had given his spirit to. They had not rejected him like the rest of the Israelites, but the majority did. And if by grace, then, is it no more of works? No. It wasn't the old covenant. Now it's by grace are you saved. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it were of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Paul twists it up, doesn't he? Makes it very difficult for us to understand. But he's taught me it's not works. It's you trust in God. By grace are you saved. But I'll show you my uh, faith by my works. Another story. What then? What, what do we conclude by this? Israel has not obtained that which he seeks for. The nation of Israel had not obtained the opportunity for salvation. Except that elect few that God had called. Paul being one of those. But the election has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now keep that in mind, rest. You're going to see that word again later on. The rest were blinded. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this very day. 
Now going on down, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. God says, all right, if you don't want it, I'll offer it to the Gentiles. Hadn't been offered before. Peter was flabbergasted when he saw that vision of that sheet coming down with all those unclean animals on it. The Lord said, eat. He said, not me. I've never eaten anything unclean. Now, they had never associated with the Gentiles. If they went down under the old system, they went down and rubbed shoulders with the Gentiles in the shopping place. They had to come back and wash themselves, bathe themselves. They were so much better than those Gentiles. So this was a new concept introduced to the church at that time. God had chosen, as we continue to read, verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle, of the Gentiles, and I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh. He said, perhaps by you people getting called, some of those Israelites will come around and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them by the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And then he goes on and explains about the first fruit being holy and the root being holy and so forth. Then he goes on and chastises them and, and reminds them, he says, now look, just because God is calling you, don't you go make fun of the Israelites. Don't you get caught up in your pride and your vanity and don't we do the same thing because once God calls us and we shouldn't look down on our neighbors or our family members because they don't understand what you're trying to tell them. They just can't, can't get it. But he says in verse 20, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. You see, he's using an analogy here of a tree. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. He says, you remember the word fear, reverence, respect for God. That's how they were to, supposed to be living. For if God spared not the natural branches, which was Israel, take heed lest he also spare not you. Now, they didn't believe. Now, if you slip back, in, back into unbelief, you can be whacked off that tree. So here we got a tree symbolized as God's uh, truth, as his church. Now, in verse 23, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So well, here's this tree, and first of all, it was symbolic of Israel. But they didn't believe, so they went in and pruned it. Whacked all those unbelieving limbs off because they weren't producing any fruit. They were just going to cause the tree maybe to die. So we had to trim it all off. Then they came along with these Gentiles, and they grafted into that tree. But he says, now once the Israelites believe, they can be grafted back in and become a part of that, that tree as well. Verse 24, for if you were cut out, of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, the Israelites, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. They can come into the family of God. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Now notice the next part of that scripture. How long is this going to last? How long is this blindness to Israel going to take place? How long is God going to leave the shield, the blindfold on their eyes? The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become. Luke 21. Luke 21. Verse 20. Now, if you're familiar with Luke 21, it's a companion scripture to Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and some of the scriptures in Revelation and Daniel. But to save time, I'm not going to go through the whole scenario. But I will begin in verse 20. And he says, When you shall see Jerusalem. Now, we've gone through this. Mr. Taylor went through it eloquently last night about um, the Feast of Tabernacles and why we observe it and how at this last time 
the nations are going to gather at Armageddon. And Satan the devil will have inspired the kings of the earth. And they're going to gather at Armageddon and come down against Jerusalem. It says all nations will be gathered against them. Now, if your eyes are open, you'll begin to see what's taking place in the Middle East and how the nations of the world hate Israel or the nation that is called Israel today. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. We get two things here. We get the fact that Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by these armies, but the abomination of desolation will take place. Now, we understand that the man of sin, Paul explains this in the book of Thessalonians, that the man of sin will go down into Jerusalem and set up his office, and there will be something down there, possibly a statue, as it was, was uh, uh, what's he, a, a preview before that. Uh, I can't think of the guy's name, but he was a forerunner. And uh, they set up, they sacrificed a swine uh, in the temple of God, set up a statue, and I'm certain they will set up another statue there as well. And so we see the abomination taking place. So what's the time setting here? The time of the end, a future event for us, something we need to be watching for. It says, but at that time, let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, just as they did in 70 A.D., and let them which are in the midst of it get out. Don't go in. Get out. Flee. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Prophecy is going to take off real quick when you see this happening. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress. Talk about tribulation in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down. How long? Trodden down by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So that's a future event that's yet to take place. The times of the Gentiles. The Israelites are going to be blinded until that is fulfilled as well. Now, going back to Daniel, the fourth chapter. Daniel 4. Daniel, of course, you know, was in captivity there. The first world ruling empire of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. That's verse 1, Daniel 4. Now here's Nebuchadnezzar trying to go tell us something. I thought it good to show you signs and wonders that the high God has wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Hmm. Must have known something about the great God, this great king. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. He had a dream. So he called for all of his magicians. They came in. They couldn't give him an answer. But there was one man in the kingdom that he relied on to tell him the truth. In verse 8, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Notice he says gods here because he probably still believed in many of those other pagan gods. And before him I told the dream. And so he tells him the dream. Verse 10, thus were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree. Here we have the tree again. A tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. Wow. And Mr. Smith said he likes to see a tree sitting alone. I think it's nothing more beautiful than a, a hillside, a rolling hillside maybe, and sitting out there with the entirety of the uh, sun and the moon at night and uh, the background with the clouds and that tree sitting right out there. And it just makes for a beautiful picture, doesn't it? So here was a great tree, and this tree was... It says the leaves there were fair. They were pretty to look at. And the fruit there was much. It produced a lot of fruit. And then it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it. 
and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. This tree was special. And I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher, and a holy one came down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said thus, Cut that tree down, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. <laughs> Just completely obliterate that tree. Almost obliterate it. Nevertheless, he said, after you've done all that, leave the stump and its roots. Don't uproot it, even with the band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. Well, what is this dream? No wonder it bothered him. He said, let his heart, heart, the tree can't have a heart. No, he can't, but this tree represented something represented a human. Let his heart be changed from man's, a man that has some compassion, a man that has some feelings, who can love, who can hate, a man who can think for himself, make decisions, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. In the Bible, a time is a year. So seven times would be seven years. So the matter is by the decree of the watchers and demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent, here's why I gave this, to the intent that the living, those people that are alive may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men. Do they know that now? Absolutely not. They don't know that there is a God in heaven. They don't know that there's a creator. They don't know that prophecy is being fulfilled. They don't know that. But he gave this message that they would know and to know that he gives to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the very basis to men. Men that are, have low moral character he puts over the nations. Now this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. You, O Belshazzar, who was Daniel, declare the interpretation. What's it mean? All the wise men can't tell me. But he says, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. He knew that Daniel was special. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, came to him and he said in the bottom part of verse 19, My Lord, the dream is to them that hate you and the interpretation thereof to your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew, was strong, whose height reached into the heavens, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, the fruit thereof much. And he goes on and explains what we read earlier. Verse 22, it's you, O king. You are that tree. You are a rule whirling empire. You had tiny nations under you. The beasts of the field yielded to you. You had the power to kill. You had the power to give life. You had the power over these nations. And that's you. And you're going to be cut down. He says, you had dominion in verse, the last part of verse 22 over the entirety of the earth, a world-ruling empire. And the king saw a watcher in verse 23 and saying, cut down the tree, destroy it, leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field seven times. That was going to take place. Well, that did happen. Nebuchadnezzar lost all sense of humanity. And for seven long years, he wallowed around in the grass. And he was supposed to stay out there until he learned that God does rule over the nations. It says his hair become matted. His fingernails grew long and gnarly. And I'm sure the hair began to grow down his neck and all over his back and on his arms. Reminds me kind of Howard Hughes when he went into seclusion. Scared to death he was going to catch a germ. Didn't want to be around anybody, wouldn't get his hair cut, and he just became a recluse. But this was probably even worse. Now verse 27, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you, 
and break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquities, by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of your tranquility. Verse 30, the king spoke and said, well, let me back up just a minute. After God told him all this, we need to read verse 28. And this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. After God telling him what was going to happen. And after revealing himself to him, the king walked out and he says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Look what I have done. Look at all these beautiful hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world. Boy, I have done great things. God says, you didn't get the message, did you, Nebuchadnezzar? Verse 31, while the word was still in his mouth, before he got through speaking, while the thought was still in his mind, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from you. And immediately he lost his mind. For seven long years, he lost his mind. Now, you're familiar with a day for a year concept, aren't you? When the nation of Israel, which we've already proven, rejected God and split into two nations, and the northern ten tribes under Jeroboam, were so afraid that the Israelites would go back down to Jerusalem and join their brothers of Judah down there, that he actually changed the Feast of Tabernacles from the seventh month to the eighth month. Didn't want them down there associating with them at that time. Changed the Sabbath to Sunday. And so God said, enough's enough. So between 721 and 718, God sent the Assyrians down and they took them captive and destroyed the kingdom. And he said, for seven times seven, I'm going to punish you. Now, seven times seven, there's 30 days in the Jewish month, 360 days in a year. Seven times that would be 2,520 days. So from 721 to 718 to the year 1803, when Thomas Jefferson made the decision to purchase the Louisiana, Louisiana Territory, doubling the size of the United States, bringing tremendous wealth and possibility upon us, God removed that punishment. But they were punished seven times. And then, about a hundred years later, the Jews decided they were going to rebel against God too, around 604 B.C. So they too were punished. 2,520 years. 1917, Britain finally gained control of the Israelites, and then finally the Jews gained control as they are today. So, we look at Daniel, and we learn that they didn't turn to God, because later on, you look at the fifth chapter, and verse 18, now, Nebuchadnezzar's son comes along, and he says, O oh, you king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. But verse 20, But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and it says his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appoints over it whosoever he will. So when Nebuchadnezzar woke up, he understood that. But, verse 22, O you his son Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you've lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven and they have brought the vessels of the house and continued the rebellious ways. So, I'm not sure the exact date here, but if you want to do a little math, the times of the Gentiles, they were going to be punished as a type of seven years of Nebuchadnezzar crawling around in the grass. The seven times, the times of the Gentiles for 2,520 years. 
Now, as I said, I don't know when it started. I know when it's going to end. We just read about it in Luke 21. When you see Jerusalem encompassed by armies, the abomination of desolation takes place. If you want to put 2,520 years down, and let's just take a date. My Bible says 537 B.C. You should subtract 537 B.C. from 2,520. I got 1983. No. It's evident that that didn't happen in 1983. And I don't set dates. But 1983 is not far behind us. So we may have missed up 30, 40, 50 years. Who knows? But we do know how it's going to end. And we know when the times of the Gentiles is going to be fulfilled. When you come to Revelation 11, 15, it says the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of, this, of, of God. So God is going to claim that at his return at the seventh trump. So then all the kingdoms, as Daniel said, that stone, that mighty statue uh, with Nebuchadnezzar at the top and then those ten toes at the bottom made of iron and clay, when that stone comes and smacks them on the toes and they collapse and blow away, then that's the end of the Gentile nations. And then God sets up his kingdom. So you see how the Gentiles have rejected God. How you see how the Israelites have rejected God and they all have blinders over their eyes. But Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is patient to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all would come to repentance. And he also said in Romans 11, 26, that all Israel are going to be saved or well, at least a majority of them. So God is not slack concerning his promise. So God developed this plan of salvation to save all of mankind, at least those that would listen. And that plan involves and is revealed to you by his holy days. And we've been emphasizing that throughout this entire feast. We've been emphasizing the fact that you, you are the called. You are the ones who have had the veil removed from your eyes. And you can see things that these other people can't. The Gentiles, the Israelites are still blinded to this day. But it says in John 6, 44, no man can come to me unless the Father draw him. So you were drawn. I was drawn. I have my story to tell. You have your story to tell. Whatever it was that brought you to the knowledge of the truth, it was God that did it. So no man can come to me unless the Father draw him. We read in the book of Acts, Acts 26. Acts 26. And verse 15. And I said, who are you, Lord? This is when Paul was struck down on the road to Damascus. And he heard this voice. He said, who are you? Who do I hear? He was blinded. He said, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. But rise and stand up on your feet, for I have appeared unto you for this purpose, I called you for this purpose, just as he called you for some specific purpose. Now, I don't know whether you can grasp that or not, but he's training you right now, and we've said this so many times, for a specific purpose. Paul knows what he was called to do, to make you a minister and a witness, both of these things which you have seen and of those things in which I will appear unto you. I'm going to, I'm going to lead you along the way. I'm going to help you. Delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. Why did he send him? What was he supposed to do? What is his ministry supposed to do? To open their eyes. To turn them from darkness, from blindness. To light, which is truth. And from the power of Satan unto God. We're supposed to help rescue you from Satan's clutches. Through our ministry. Through our teaching through our instruction that you may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now, 1 Corinthians 15. This is what I love about God's plan. 1 Corinthians 15, number, uh, verse 19, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now, we've got... 
a greater hope than that. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and because he did, he became the first fruits, the first one of those that had died and been resurrected, sitting at the right hand of the Father. For since by man, Adam, came death, by man, Jesus, came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, no other name under heaven which you can be saved, has to be Jesus Christ. You have to believe, you have to accept him, and through him all will be made alive. All. But, but, every man in his own order. How many times I've heard ministers read that and not understand what it means. Christ explains it. I'm the first fruit, he said. And then afterward, they that are Christ that is coming. Who is that? Why, it's you. It's the saints. It's all those in Hebrews 11 that are waiting on us, as we heard read to us. Those are the first fruits. But he doesn't go on and elaborate there. What about those Israelites? What about those Gentiles that are blinded? God said he would have all come to repentance and to the knowledge of the truth. God doesn't lie. What about them? What about my mother, my father, your mother, your father if they weren't called? What about those? What about all those people that Nebuchadnezzar and his armies killed and slaughtered, followed by the Medes and the Persians, by the Greeks and the Romans and the seven resurrections? Nothing but war. Nothing but killing. Millions upon millions, if not billions of people, lying smoldering in the grave. What about all those in the Civil War? Kill more of our brothers and sisters, probably in some of the other wars. World War I, World War II, Korea, and then people that just died along the way, settling our country. Many of them killed by Indians. Many of them just died in the mountains of the Rockies that couldn't get through. All those people they never heard the name of Jesus Christ, never knew the plan of God. What about all those? Revelation 20. Revelation 20. In verse 4, we see John saw the thrones and they that sat upon them. He saw you folks sitting up there on these thrones, and judgment was given to them, and the souls of them that were beheaded. And some of God's people have been martyred. And they had the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There you go. Now you're all out there working. Now you're all out there administering the government of God on the earth. Some of you are ruling cities. Some of you are uh, teaching in the colleges and universities and uh, teaching God's word because we heard that the law is going to go out from Jerusalem. Is going to encompass the whole earth. When those people come up to the Feast of Tabernacles to observe it, if they come, if they don't, plagues will hit them. But you'll be out there instructing them for the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles. You'll be teaching about the days of unleavened bread. You'll be teaching them about Pentecost. You're going to teach them about God's way and His law. You'll be teaching all those people. But then we read in the verse 5, but the rest of the dead. Remember I said the rest? Remember that word? Here they are, the rest of the dead. They didn't live again until those thousand years are ended. At the, at the end of the millennium, all those billions of people are going to live. Ezekiel 37 explicitly explains it. What a fantastic passage. When all those dried bones begin clattering, shaking, coming together, you can hear it probably for miles around. And they begin to stand on their feet. Flesh comes on them. The hearts begin to beat. Hair begins to pop out on her head. They begin to hear things, see things, smell things. And they begin looking around and they say, all is lost. Man, what's going to happen? What's happening to me? I remember the last thing that I was laying in a hotel, in a, uh, excuse me, a, a hospital room with tubes sticking in my arms. And I remember I felt l lousy, but now I feel pretty good. But they were still a, a new physical body. And then all, all of a sudden they hear the fact that God says, I'm going to put my spirit in you. He's calling them. He's opening their minds. He's removing the blindness from them. Now they see. So I don't understand why I didn't see that when you told me, Uncle Jed. He said, I was too stubborn. I didn't want to hear it. I'd rather do it my own way. I wasn't ready yet, was I? No, but you're ready now, aren't you? Let's go to school. Let's learn. Learn of me. And so they begin to become converted. 
And they have a, a thousand years of God's government on the earth to look at and to see the result of what obedience to God will bring you and the happiness and the joy. And you'll be able to embrace your grandparents, your mothers, your fathers. Some of you may have lost children along the way. It will be one happy family reunion at that particular period of time. That is explained in Revelation 20, verse 13. I'm sorry, verse 11. And John saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And he said, he, I saw the dead. I saw the small. I saw the great. The kings of the earth are going to be resurrected. Peasants. Aborigines. <laughs> pygmies. From all nations. From all walks of life. Men, women, children, they're going to stand before God. Just as when he called you, and he said, judgment is now in the house of God. You're go they were going to be judged just as we were from the books. This same book that I proved years ago is the word of God. It's the truth. And that's the textbook we're going to use. We're not going to use any evolutionary concepts. We won't be using any of the religions of the world. No, we're going to use God's word. And we're going to teach right from that. And all these people are going to be taught. And they're going to be judged out of those things which are written in the books. According to the works. Just like you now. In this training period. That you're going through. Are going to be judged. And you'll be rewarded according to your works. It's a marvelous plan, isn't it? I hope you grasp it. I hope you can comprehend that plan. And I hope that, and I tried to explain, I went to great lengths about how important the Sabbath is, about how important the holy days are. You cannot afford to miss them. You're missing out on instruction about how you're going to rule in the kingdom. And God is watching every move we make. He knows our thoughts, our intents. You've got to understand what a God we serve and how awesome he is. And we've got to obey him to the, with his help through the Holy Spirit. It's not something you take lightly. It's not something you work into your busy schedule. It's something that you must do. You work your busy schedule around God's plan. And you focus your life around the Sabbath. And you begin preparing on Friday. You begin preparing for the feast next year by saving your second tithes so that when you are able to come, you'll have money to pay for it, as God instructed us. Because, continuing to read in Revelation 20, we read in Revelation 20, verse 13, the sea gave up the dead. Wait a minute. We heard of a resurrection at Christ's return we heard of a resurrection, the great white throne judgment resurrection at the end of the millennium. What's he talking about here? And there will be people that will just ignore these scriptures, but you can't. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one according to their works. This doesn't go along with the white throne judgment. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. That is eternal death. And that is relegated to those who have had their calling, who have had their opportunity, and rejected. Would not repent. They chose to do their own way. So they will end up not having their names written in the book of life. And they were cast into the lake of fire. Now that as far as we know it, completes the seven annual holy day plan. But we know that God created the universe. We know there's planets out there that they don't even know exist. We know that God has a far greater plan than just this small group and those Gentiles and those Israelites coming to the knowledge of the truth and entering into his family. Now, I strongly suspect 
that once that plan is completed, we begin to settle the universe. You want to be a part of it? You have that opportunity because you are the first fruits and you are in on the ground floor. So for now, that completes God's great plan of salvation. As you return home, please be safe. And God willing, we'll see you again next year.